I would like to thank Dr. Graham Wrightson and South Dakota State University for once again hosting the Many Faces of War conference. I will preface this presentation by stating that this is based off of preliminary research from my master's dissertation with SOAS University of London and therefore is not complete. Unit 731, Imperial Japan's Facility of Rape for the Sake of Research. Since the invasion of Manchuria, China by the Imperial Japanese military in September of 1931, the issue of venereal disease has been of major concern due to the consistent violent sexual crimes perpetrated by the Imperial Japanese military. In 1935, the Manchu Detachment 731 was established in the Pingfang district of Harbin, the largest city in the Japanese puppet state of Manchu Go, located in the northeastern region of China. This facility would become colloquially known as Unit 731. It was an institution that would host a variety of inhumane human experiments and testing that had ever been conducted. These tests included, but were not limited to, the testing of weapons, including chemical and biological, exposure to various conditions such as extreme heat, cold, and dehydration, along with that of venereal disease. Through rampant sexual assault and rape with a broad range of sex-based experiments that were conducted using primarily female and child prisoners, including those that required female prisoners to be forcibly impregnated in order to test the transmission of various venereal disease between mother and fetus as well as mother and child. Even prior to the atrocities committed by the Imperial Japanese in Nanking, China, that would eventually lead to the establishment of the military comfort system of state-run human trafficking and sexual slavery, which would, in part, be seen as a quasi-solution to both sexual violence against occupied territories, as well as to stifle the rate of transmissions of sexually transmitted diseases. Imperial Japan has been committed sexual crimes against humanity with their treatment and testing of prisoners within Unit 731. This paper is to highlight these sexual crimes as not only a precursor to the future acts they would commit, but also that the sex-based crimes against humanity to prevent the spread of venereal disease stem meaningfully prior to the acts of Nanking. During the period of the Second Sino-Japanese War, which would fold itself into the Second World War from 1931 through 1945, the Imperial Japanese attempted to systematically bolster their credentials as a leading world power by establishing scientific facilities in an attempt to display that they had equal or more so the greater goal of surpassing the Western powers. The experiments conducted within Unit 731 was a meaningful part of this attempt, with medical professionals conducting experiments on human subjects, with the results being disseminated to establish Japan's ability to contribute to the global scientific fields. Though the primary research of these tests, or more so crimes, had been that of females and children, men were also not spared either. With a large amount of these sex-based experiments or more so crimes lacking in rational or scientific motivations with experiments and acts that can't be attributed to anything other than gross excess of senseless violence. While some testing at the facility could have been justified for the attempt to either cure disease, develop various chemical or biological weapons, and or to prove Japan's place among the other world power in the sciences, the sex-based crimes conducted for the sake of research fail to meet these standards. We may ask ourselves, why were these sex-based experiments unique? Why were women whose limbs were black with disease raped by multiple guards at once? Why were prisoners abused and defiled as their children, who were a result of enforced pregnation, watched? In terms of the abuses that occurred, it is easy to homogenize sex crimes and sex experiments as the same thing. However, when analyzing these incidents, it becomes clear that guards of facility were motivated by different factors, which contrast the sexual violence propagated against the inmate population within the parameters of testing. This distinction is that the guards, staff, and independent medical practitioners that perpetrated these types of crimes against humanity had been as actions of individuals independent of the military scientific establishment that operated and conceived of the unit and the clinical sex experiments.
For limitations of this paper, I will be focusing on the quote military scientific testing portion with the individual acts being a topic of discussion for another paper. However, consideration of what constitutes sexual abuse is culturally and historically specific. Furthermore, a global definition of what international courts consider sex crimes has not yet been established. Despite this, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court establishes a framework of which we can analyze sex crimes against humanity. Unfortunately, the definition groups specific acts as sex crimes, but not establish a framework by which crimes can be judged as sexual offenses. The Rome Statute provides some clarity stating that rape, sexual slavery, and forced prostitution, forced pregnancy, and forced sterilization, or any other form of sexual violence of comparable gravity as definitely sex crimes against humanity. While all crimes committed at the facility, both human sexual experiments and individual violence experienced by prisoners at the hands of the individual guards and staff were sex crimes against humanity, sex experiments will be defined as experiments that were sexual in nature that had a clear aim to produce a medically relevant result. The head practitioner, Shiro Ichi, was a microbiologist turned medical officer. Through his amassing of political capital and various relationships among the powerful within Japan, he was able to turn the 1931 invasion of China into an opportunity for his medical work. And by 1935, the further development and construction of Unit 731, which was a previously existing yet underdeveloped complex with virtually no ability to contain prisoners efficiently, by 1938, the laboratory prison consisted of six square kilometer area housing five buildings surrounded by trenches, electrical gates, and barbed wire fences. And by 1939, Ishii had been given power to run Unit 731 operations in near secrecy. At its height, the Japanese program consisted of more than 150 buildings in Pingfang, five satellite camps, and the staff of more than 3,000 scientists. Unfortunately, Ishii and his team managed to negotiate and receive immunity in 1946 from Japanese war crimes prosecution before the Tokyo Tri Tribunal in exchange for their full disclosure. Although the Soviet authorities wished prosecutions had taken place, the U.S. objected at the reports of the investigating U.S. microbiologists amongst those were Chief of Fort Detrick, Riley D. Housewright, whose report stated that the information was absolutely invaluable and it could have never been obtained in the United States because of scruples attached to experimentation on humans and the information was obtained fairly cheaply. The facility was created initially with the goal or its mission to advance the offensive capabilities of Imperial Japan's military and provide solutions to internal problems that weaken the formidability of the forces, with sex-based experiments seemingly to be performed in accordance with this. That is, that they were conceptualized to solve sexual disease that had been rampant within its ranks. Research at Unit 731 took as its starting point a simple yet correct observation. More soldiers die in wartime from disease than battle. Accordingly, sex experiments were conceived to combat the rising prevalence of venereal disease within Japan's military. The prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases is evident in its euphemistic moniker as the scourge of armies. In addition to creating treatments for sexual diseases, doctors at Unit 71 also use experiments to further educate themselves about the human and more so female anatomy. Mr. Makino, a former medical practitioner, provided testimony of the operations he assisted while stationed in Pingfang. These barbaric acts were educational. To improve his knowledge of anatomy, we removed some of the organs and amputated legs and arms. Two of the victims were young women, 18 or 19 years old. I hesitate to say it, but we opened up their wombs to show the younger soldiers. They had very little experience and knew very little about women. It was sex education. Likewise, surgeons used these experiments as an opportunity to practice procedures that would be needed in or as a result of battle. Common procedures included amputations, removing bullets, suturing, and performing transplants and transfusions, amongst others. Perhaps ironically, 
the necessity of testing of venereal disease with human experimentation is one crime against humanity was created in response to another crime against humanity propagated by the Japanese military, which then created other crimes against humanity. The military comfort system in which women were confined to comfort stations and forced to service the sexual needs of the Japanese forces with the testing within Unit 731 as a precursor to the eventual former creation of the military comfort system, which was infamously sparked with the Nanking Massacre in late 1937, in which over the course of a roughly six-week period, soldiers of the Imperial Japanese Army, disarmed combatants, and murdered civilians who numbered over a conservative estimate of 40,000 and perpetrated widespread acts of looting, sexual assault, and rape, was to curtail sexually transmitted disease amongst the ranks in the case of Unit 731's experimentation with the comfort si system also having this with a secondary goal of reducing sexual misconduct and assault amongst civilians of occupied territories. Subject views for sexual experiments were diverse and varied. Organizers of the unit made it great efforts to ensure diversity of ethnicity within the population of the prison in order to ensure testing was universally applicable. A continuous supply of subjects was furnished by the military police and army officials through special transfers and other methods, with an average of 500 subjects being received by the facility annually. Some inmates were just simply rounded up off the streets of Harbin to meet the quotas. In special relation to sexual experiments, some women from the conference stations throughout China and Korea were also relocated to Unit 731. Of the more than 10,000 prisoners suspected to have been killed in Unit 731, at least 3,000 of these victims were prisoners of war, which included Korean, Chinese, Mongolian, Soviet, American, British, as well as Australian soldiers. Female prisoners were especially diverse. Findings revealed that white Russian women and even Indonesian female prisoners were used. Currently, little to substantiate the idea that children were a prominent portion of the inmate population exists or has currently been found. This is not to say that children were not immune from testing, just that they were not subject to imprisoned testing in the same proportion as adult women and men. The biological weapons and pathogens were tested on children in towns surrounding the unit. Children used in experiments conducted inside the unit were the result of the forced female prisoners' pregnancies while incarcerated. In some cases, males were also used in sex experiments, usually in the cases that sexually transmitted diseases need to be spread to other prisoners. Forced compilation between men and women would occur. These groups, children and men, while subject to sexual experiments, did not endure the same amount of abusive sex crimes that were exercised by guards and staff upon women. Experimentation on humans that took place at Unit 731 can be categorized in two different approaches. The first consists of bacteriological studies, those in which subjects were deliberately infected with disease in order to view its progression and search for cures. The second approach was physiological studies, which involved viewing how subjects reacted to a stimulus. Both were performed at Unit 731 and featured in scientific publications. Sick experiments authorized by organizers were predominantly bacteriological in nature. The majority of sex experiments tested transmission and treatment of venereal disease. Of the diseases investigated in this context, none was of greater priority than that of syphilis. Developing a cure for syphilis was crucial to treating and rehabilitating infected soldiers, amongst whom the prevalence of syphilis was high due to the systematic rape of women in occupied territories and later the widespread use of sex slaves. However, while serums were easily produced to infect patients with tuberculosis, smallpox, and other pathogens, infecting those with syphilis could not be as easily facilitated by injection. Accordingly, doctors orchestrated forced sex acts between infected and non-infected prisoners to transmit the disease. Consider this testimony of a prison guard on the subject of devising a method for transmission of syphilis between patients. Infection of venereal disease by injection was abandoned 
and these researchers started forcing the prisoners into sexual acts with each other. Four or five unit members dressed in white laboratory clothing, completely covering their bodies with only eyes and mouths visible, handled the tests. A male and a female, one infected with syphilis, would be brought together in a cell and forced into sex with each other. It was made clear that anyone resisting would be shot. The individuals orchestrating the forced acts are described almost as accessories to the overall framework of the experiments. Dressed in white, with only eyes and mouth visible, their individual dominance was not expressed. Instead, they served as a panoptic extension and as a reminder that copulation was required and consequences would be forced if the prisoners resisted. As their victims were infected, they were vivisected at different stages of infection so that internal and external organs could be observed as disease progressed. Counterintuitive with the goals of Unit 731, testimony from multiple guards rhetorically blamed the female victims as being hosts of disease, even as they were forcibly infected. Genitals of female prisoners that were infected with syphilis were often called jam-filled buns by guards. This colloquial degradation of the prisoners sharply contrasted with the clinical numbers by which the staff referred to patients for the purpose of official experimentation. Beyond the effects of syphilis infection in adults, doctors also want to understand how children affected by various pathogens, a youth court member deployed to train at Unit 701 recalled viewing a batch of subjects that would undergo syphilis testing. One was a Chinese woman holding an infant. One was a white Russian woman with a daughter of four or five years. And the last was a white Russian woman with a boy of about six or seven. The children of these women were tested in ways similar to other patients and to their parents, with specific emphasis on determining how long in infection periods affected the effectiveness of treatments. In short, some children grew up inside of the walls of Unit 731 infected with syphilis. Women prisoners were forced to become pregnant for a use of experimentation, specifically with the plausibility of vertical transmission from mother to fetus or mother to child. This was especially true in the case of syphilis, which was suspected to affect fertility. Whether or not the fetus survived and if its mother's reproductive organs were compromised was of great interest to the practitioners. Though a large number of babies were born in captivity of Unit 731, there has been little to no account of any survivors of the facility, children included. It is suspected that the children of female prisoners were either killed or the pregnancies were terminated. While male practitioners were often used in single studies so that the results of experimentation on them would not be clouded by other valuables, while individual women would be used repeatedly in bacteriological, physiological, and sex-based experiments. As mentioned previously, men were also subject to sexual experiments. Sex acts between male and female partners were forced, especially in the case of venereal disease study. Male prisoners were subject to a wide or rather odd spectrum of testing, including forced male-on-male sex acts and genital manu- mutilation. For example, it's hard to imagine what type of information Japanese soldiers sought when they inserted glass rods into male patients' rectums. It is in this case of experimentation that it is a difficult to parse sex experiments and sex crimes. However, it seems likely that because these male prisoners of the unit were definitionally enemy combatants, sexual violence propagated towards them could be a result of wartime aggression and more closely classified with that of war crimes over crimes against humanity or sex crimes. The unit was overwhelmingly successful in terms of medical innovation, including development of therapies, vaccines, surgical techniques, both in hospital and on the battlefield, and transfusion of blood. In fact, the current method of treating frostbite was developed as a result of the experiments conducted, which involves submerging limbs in warm water instead of applying direct heat. The unit's contributions to global health, new ways of water treatment, treating dysentery, performing surgeries, and much more 
cannot be understated or simply ignored. Innovations developed at this facility are credited to have reduced wartime death by 8% overall and were the basis for much medical innovation after the surrender of Japan and the closing of the facility. The cost of these advances was estimated 3,000 lives inside the facility and many thousands more that were subject to various field testings. This paper has attempted to present the extraordinary suffering of those that had been sexually abused within the context of the scientific and medical mission of Unit 731. While still acknowledging the various sex-based crimes that had been committed outside of these particular focus. While tremendous suffering was endured by all prisoners, those who endured an additional burden of sex, sexual acts by those who committed these crimes against humanity should be recognized as especially heinous. Who cannot hide behind the comforting thought that the unit produced scientifically beneficial research more importantly, the victims of these crimes should be acknowledged and remembered. It is these women, children, and men that suffered and that should be credited for the success of the unit and what it has made possible. However, we cannot forget the drive behind the establishment of the unit, as well as the methods and purpose of the testing involving venereal disease within the goal of which was to prevent the spread of disease amongst their soldiers through this desire and the fear of the scourge amongst the ranks. The Imperial Japanese attempted to curtail not only crimes against humanity by perpetrating further crimes against humanity, but also curtail the direct consequences of their sex-based crimes within them, as well as in occupied territories. Even prior to the formal creation of the military conference system, the fear of the scourge drove the Imperial Japanese to commit heinous acts of sexual violence against unwilling participants out of fear of disease. Thank you.